she has uh, come up with various strategies and models and worked with uh, uh, disaster affected people also and 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 her model ha has been seen to be you know like very successful in other parts of the world and uh, thank you so much for being with us dr kurtney and uh, hopefully uh, with where she is working with her university under her uh, her guidance and 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 our university we also have actually uh, you know uh, uh, come up with one very huge project in the area of climate change and disaster uh, preparedness and management and uh, hopefully from there we'll be able to do something you know in india and for mizoram also and welcome to all the participants and uh, uh, and uh, we are happy that to know that we have had a, a wonderful response from 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 people across the world and especially in india and in mizoram too and uh, so the, the how the this talk will 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 uh, will take place is first uh, dr kurdi will present present her talk and then uh, and then after that will be followed by uh, uh, Dr. Kalpana, and then and then after that I'll 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 give the conclusions. I will be moderating the the talk show, and there is a question and answer button uh, in, in this link, and we uh, would like to invite question and answers from all the part participants. Do not use the chat button, please. Uh, whatever queries you have, please uh, you know type it in the question and answer button, which uh, hopefully, uh, if time permits, we will be able to answer to all of the questions. Uh, with that, uh, without any further delay, uh, let me uh, introduce you Dr. Kurtney to present her paper. Thank you, Dr. Kurtney. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and the invitation. And I'm enthusiastic about the possibility of us actually working together in person in the future. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Oops, sorry. There we go. Okay, there we go. So, and let me just minimize my window here. So again, thank you for the opportunity. I think you all can see my screen now, is that correct? Yes, yes, it is visible with them. Great, thank you. So um, as Dr. Henry mentioned, I've done a, a fair amount of research over the last several years, particularly in Southeast Asia. In recent years, I've worked extensively in Nepal, all over the country, in fact, as well as in uh, Malaysia, Bangladesh, um, Myanmar, and I've worked primarily with displaced communities, so internally displaced communities as well as refugee groups, and that includes groups that are displaced as a result of earthquakes, flood, and also complex humanitarian crises involving civil conflict. Now today I won't be talking so much about my personal research, but I'll be talking in more practical terms. This is actually a modified version of a presentation that I was asked to give uh, for the University of Colorado Network, and that included students, alumni, and community members. And really the invitation for that talk came because many people were struggling with mental health issues in the context of ongoing challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so when Dr. Henry reached out and asked me to give a, a similar talk, I thought, you know, people can look up my research and publications and I would love to give a research-based talk at a later date, but really it seems that in the current context, practical strategies might be more useful for people. So I hope you don't mind indulging me. Also, I just wanna start by saying, you know, of course I don't know each of you on this particular call, but I imagine that this is a very heterogeneous audience. I mean, in the context of this particular presentation, I believe people are primarily from India and various areas, not only Mizoram, but also thinking more specifically, there are those of you who presumably are currently working from home, those who may be essential workers still working, but potentially at personal risk. Uh, there may be healthcare workers that are on the call. I teach at a medical school, so I work with uh, a number of healthcare workers, doctor, ner doctors, nurses, and others. Um, some of you on the call may have lost a job or may be experiencing financial strain. 
as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of you may be parents caring for children at all developmental stages, and that may include children who are now home out of school due to the pandemic. Um, also, there may, may be those of you that are caring for others, older parents, those with special needs. Uh, you may be part of a team at work where you're in charge of the well-being of others, and so you may be thinking about the needs of your team members. Um, you may be in a high-risk group yourself. You may be older, medically fragile, and you may have been in a situation where you've lost a loved one to COVID-19. Uh, you may be struggling with your own health issues. You may be living in a difficult situation where being at home under lockdown conditions is really far from ideal. Um, you know, I've worked over the years with communities and individuals also experiencing domestic violence. And so we've seen, for example, in the US in particular, a spike in domestic violence and child abuse in the context of the current crisis associated with lockdown. And that's particularly difficult because there are diminished access to services as well. Also, I'm thinking a lot about those with pre-existing mental health issues that are likely to be in a position where things are worsening in the context of COVID-19 in terms of their mental health and well-being. And those struggling with stigma or discrimination, I've, I've worked extensively in the last few years with Rohingya communities, both in Malaysia and Bangladesh, um, and to some lesser extent in Myanmar and Thailand. And we've really seen a spike in xenophobia and discrimination uh, associated with this pandemic. And of course that has huge mental health implications as well as other implications. So there are many, that, there are many other groups that may be I haven't represented here, but I just wanted this slide as an introductory slide to say I recognize that each of us are coming from very different circumstances, and I like the idea of solidarity and we're all in this together, but I'm not sure that that fully captures it. So rather than that, I, I prefer this expression, that we are not all in the same boat, but we're in the same storm, and everyone may be experiencing their own struggles. So just for a minute, I want to help orient the audience to the current context of COVID-19 pandemic globally. So this is the COVID-19 uh, CDC tracker. This is also uh, represented on the John Hopkins website, which is another reliable source of information. You can see, of course, in North America, the US, we are very much struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic. So recent data indicates that we have over 85,000 deaths. And in Colorado, I'm based in the state of Colorado, and I'm speaking to you from the city of Denver. And we have over 1,000 deaths in Colorado State. And of those, over 200, almost, almost nearly 250, are in the Denver area. So our current situation is such that starting about mid-March, we went into to almost complete lockdown conditions with essential workers still able to work, but others being told that they needed to stay at home. And since that time now, we have recently begun to transition. So if you think about it, a lockdown is like a five phase process and phase five is the most extreme lockdown. We are moving from phase five to phase four. Initially, the, the lockdown was called safe at home and now we're moving to a safer at home scenario. What that means is that there's a little bit more freedom of movement, but things are still extremely restricted. We can't have any large group gatherings, restaurants can't open back up, they have to do curbside delivery and whatnot. So um, we're still under quite restricted conditions. Now, I think you all could probably um, let me know if, if this information is incorrect or to the extent that you have updated information. But again, this is from the John Hopkins site as of 14 May. Uh, that in India, there have been over 80,000 cases confirmed and 2,649 people have died. And so as we think about this and we juxtapose the situation in India with the situation in the US, and I believe in Mizoram, there are relatively very few cases. So I think it also depends on where you are, of course. I mean, in Colorado, while we do have a number of cases, we are actually far better off, for example, than New York. Um, which is really struggling as well as Seattle and some other areas. So throughout this presentation, if you don't mind, I'd like you to uh, consider the following. I want you to think about innovative ways that you have stayed socially connected and engaged despite the circumstances that have unfolded in terms of so-called social distancing with regard to COVID-19 pandemic. 
And I want you to think about examples of coping strategies that you found useful during this challenging time. What are your thoughts also about differences and similarities between an audience of students and others in Colorado, USA, for example, compared to Mizoram, India or elsewhere in India? So during this brief presentation, I'm going to go over a few things. One, that many people are experiencing mental health difficulties associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Some research is coming out in the past few months and it's continually evolving where we're seeing, you know, in a variety of different settings, the US and certainly globally, feelings of grief, fear, anxiety, sleep disturbances, difficulty concentrating. In addition, the so-called social distancing, what I think of as more physical distancing requirements can be emotionally challenging, potentially increasing feelings of loneliness and undermining the potential for social support. Um, and this is particularly true where there may be groups that are isolated, older individuals, particularly older individuals who may not have access to technology to stay in touch with family members easily. However, each of us can put coping strategies in place to help us manage such challenges. So during my brief presentation, I will discuss detrimental effects of chronic stress, and that's the, the kind of situation that we're seeing with the COVID-19 pandemic where things are going on for a longer period of time. Also, I'll encourage you to think about identifying coping strategies and give you some examples. And I'll encourage you to consider innovative ways to connect to and grow your social support networks. And I'll provide some resources at the end, but I also want you to think about what are the resources in your local context that you might be able to access. So I wanted to start with this idea because I think it's important for many of us. Your feelings are valid, whatever it is you may be feeling right now. Some people are feeling angry, some people are feeling sad, some people are feeling numb, some people are feeling lost and disappointed. Some people may actually be feeling, you know, happy or content to have a welcome break uh, from the daily stresses of life. Whatever you're feeling, your feelings are valid. You can appreciate what you have and recognize the struggles of others and still be sad and angry. Oftentimes you hear people talk about, well, I'm doing so well compared to others, so I don't really have a right to my feelings or I don't have a right to feel bad, but that's not true. You can still be sad and angry while appreciating and being grateful for what you have. There's so much that you can't control at the moment, including so much uncertainty. It's important for us to focus on what we can control. So again, just to highlight some of the research, People are experiencing mental health difficulties. Again, I mentioned the fear, the grief, anxiety, elevated concerns for vulnerable groups, including those with pre-existing mental health challenges. This is a link uh, just below the initial text on the left-hand side here to um, some research that's just come out recently in the US. This is actually a, a representative sample. There was an initial population-based survey prior to COVID-19. Uh, and they have been able to, that was in 2018, and they've been able to compare that to a follow-up representative sample uh, that, that was collected, data collected after the, the pandemic really took hold in the U.S. And they're seeing uh, quite alarming elevated rates of mental health challenges in a variety of different diagnostic categories. So you can also see the links below on a number of other studies. And we have the, the National Institute for Mental Health here in the US is actually doing a big nationwide longitudinal study on um, mental health effects of the pandemic. I've been involved in a bit of research as well about this, including looking at mental health and risk perception and behaviors. And so we hope to have that data in the coming months. I also want to mention, again, you know, of course, you, I want you to think about the socio-cultural political context where you are in your communities in various parts of India and think about what are some of the dynamics that might be happening with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the U.S., we're seeing some very particular dynamics. We're seeing um, increasing conflict around a political divide over the coronavirus. We have really radicalized right and left sides where uh, some people are protesting the safer at home conditions and suggesting that uh, we should disregard uh, COVID-19 pandemic and get back to our so-called normal lives. Others who want to follow health advice and epidemiologists and it's becoming very polarized along political lines 
determining, you know, your views, whether or not you're Democrat or Republican. In some cases, Republicans are essentially getting messaging that your patriotic duty is to not wear a mask and get back out there, basically to elevate risk and expose yourself. So even within families, we're seeing a lot of conflict and tension around this, particularly as we transition from a near total lockdown to sort of a phased partial reopening in some areas. We're also seeing um, that there's a lot of historical difficulties in the US that are worsening in the context of COVID-19. For example, for African-Americans, a lot of them feel that the mask wearing that's expected, for example, in Denver where I am, it's actually a city ordinance that everyone who is outside, if you're waiting outside a business or going into a business, you have to be wearing a mask. You don't have to be wearing a mask if you're walking in a park, but anywhere in or near a business or school or other setting, you have to be wearing a mask. Of course, the schools here are completely closed down though. Um, so we're having some issues around uh, racial concerns and a history of racism in the U.S. and things like adherence to public health guidance around mask wearing. We're having concerns about racism directed against Asians uh, because there is this rhetoric in the U.S. that was ratcheting up around with the Trump administration around blaming China. And so, you know, there's, again, a lot of divisiveness in the social fra fabric in the U.S. right now. And we're seeing, for example, the, the Rohingya example that I gave you in Malaysia, there is an increase often in, in xenophobia in these types of situations where people are frightened and they're looking to scapegoat or blame someone. And of course that has huge mental health implications. So let's talk a minute about stress. So one of the things that I think is important to think about is again, as the COVID-19 pandemic drags on and we are looking at you know, the so-called long game, for example, in the U.S., we're thinking, okay, maybe the schools are not going to be open by fall in, in August or September. Maybe we're going to continue with online education um, at least until January of next year. So when we think about the long-term health effects of chronic stress, we can see that there's a number of challenges that can arise. So in terms of behavioral signs, People can uh, become increasingly worried about things that they didn't worry about before. They may lose interest in things they used to enjoy. They may want to withdraw from people and activities. They may have poor concentration, confusion, forgetfulness, for forgetfulness, uncertainty, or trouble making decisions, relationship conflicts, um, depressed mood, feeling anxious, irritable, irritability, uh, getting stuck in negative thinking patterns, increased uh, maladaptive coping, excessive sm smoking or, or drinking, for example. And there may be physical signs and symptoms as well. Basically, when we think about stress, there's a certain amount of stress that can be optimal and it can actually support our performance. But once you get past that point where you're really having a very high level of stress or you're having a chronic level of stress, then that can lead to being sick, fatigued, exhausted, anxious um, and having essentially elevated risk for disease. So this is where we really worry about the long-term effects of chronic stress in a situation like the COVID-19 pandemic. So you don't need to look at the details on the back of the slide. I just wanna say, you know, there's a number of resources that are available. For example, in the US, the National Institute of Mental Health uh, we have national suicide prevention hotlines. We have a number of different resources and pamphlets and brochures and messaging coming out. The bottom line is stress affects everyone. Not all stress is bad. Long-term stress can be harmful. There are ways to manage stress and professional help and free nationwide resources, for example, in the U.S. are available. And I know in some of the work I've done in Nepal, the same is true in Nepal. National mental health hotlines and other uh, remote telemental health services that are free or low cost. So one thing that we think about when we think about practical strategies to cope with stress is we think about there's a sort of a toolkit of coping strategies and not all coping strategies work for all people. So you need to think about what has worked for you in the past to help mitigate signs and symptoms of stress. And then when you think about what you have preferred to do in the past to manage your stress, you have to ask, can I do that now? 
Is there something about the current situation that prevents me from doing what I would typically do to manage stress? So for example, um, if you hang out with friends to manage stress, or you go to the gym, or you go running to manage stress, are you still able to do those things, or do you have to modify that, those coping skills in some way? Now, again, there's a whole range of recommended coping strategies that people can easily find online and engage with, but the important component is to think about works for, what works for you. Basic stress management typically includes exercise, good nutrition, adequate sleep, adequate downtime, time for relaxation, setting realistic expectations, positive reframing of difficult situations. For example, thinking about having more time, you know, maybe with your children at home or things that, you know, maybe are unintended or surprising uh, positive outcomes of the current situation. And that doesn't negate the fact that many people are suffering and there are many uh, adverse outcomes. But also basic stress management typically includes social connection. And we're gonna talk a bit more about that in the following slides and use of humor. Humor varies cross-culturally and you know, sometimes it's hard for people to understand from one culture to another what uh, is considered to be humorous, but nonetheless, every culture and context utilizes humor typically in some form or fashion for stress relief. So here's a couple of resources sources that I think might be of use. On the left hand side is from the World Health Organization. Uh, this is basically a pamphlet around coping and a number of different organizations in many different countries have adapted this WHO coping brochure and fit it to their context. So at the top it's around normalizing your feelings. It's normal to feel sad, stressed, confused, scared, or angry during this crisis and also encouraging you to engage with your social network, talk to friends and family and others. If you're staying at home, think about maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Again, that's some of the things I already talked about in terms of sleep and diet, staying connected to friends remotely. Don't use excessive smoking, alcohol, or drugs to cope with your emotions. Consider thinking about healthy ways of coping with your stress. Um, also, make sure that you have access to accurate, timely information so that you know what's happening. And that includes visiting credible sources. So for example, I typically go to John Hopkins, uh, CDC, WHO, Colorado Department of Public Health. These are the websites I visit to get up-to-date, credible information. And I think it's important that you determine how much media intake or how much COVID-19 related information you're going to allow yourself to be exposed to in the course of a day, you know, maybe set a 20 or 30 minute limit in the morning or in the evening. And again, think about how to access sources that are credible where you could get timely and relevant information because otherwise it's easy to be overwhelmed, to be essentially assaulted all day with information and a lot of rumors and misinformation and contradictory information. And that can leave people feeling very uncertain and, in, and insecure. Um, also, as I mentioned on the other side, think about what's worked for you in terms of stress management in the past. And then just briefly on the right hand side, I want to highlight a couple things. So I've already talked about avoid excessive exposure to media coverage, connect socially, practice self-care, but thinking about children, I know that a number of people are quite concerned. Children in many contexts, and certainly it's the case in the United States and here in Colorado, have had their daily routines completely disrupted. So for example, I have a nine-year-old daughter. She's doing online school, but it's only a few hours a day. And so she really doesn't have the kind of structure that she has typically had. And she is able to connect with her friends remotely but she's not having any in-person contact with her friends. So that's been very difficult for her. It's important for children that we as adults reassure them that they're, that they're safe. We create a space for them to talk about their worries. We talk about coping skills and how we have come up with and how we're utilizing our own coping skills. And we encourage them to identify the coping skills that they like, for example, you know, dancing to their favorite music um, or some other things that they enjoy doing. And again, particularly for children limiting their news exposure and where they are exposed to the media, helping them process that information and creating a routine and structure. 
So the apps that are available in India may differ and you may have a number of different preferred apps and a variety of different languages depending on your preferences. But these are a few apps that I have found to be particularly useful in the US and also when I've been based in other countries. So for example, on the right hand side, you can see in the middle, there's the Calm app. This is essentially guided meditations, breathing programs, relaxing music. On the bottom is a Talkspace online therapy app. So this is a mechanism through which people can, it is a paid mechanism, but people can access text or live uh, remote telemental health support with trained mental health therapists. And then at the top, there's a self-help app. Um, and this is, you know, essentially a mechanism to track anxious thoughts and behaviors over time and learn different self-help techniques. On the left-hand side, you can see at the top, a mood training program app, followed by a cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy app. So these are types of intervention frameworks that typically are effective. They're, they're known to be efficacious based on research for depression, anxiety, and more. And then at the very bottom, the Mind Shift, that's a mental health app designed specifically for teenagers and young adults. So again, I would encourage you to think about what are your preferred apps, what's available in your region, and the variety of purposes that apps can actually serve. So then moving a minute to talking about this idea of social distancing. So I don't know if it's been the case in your part of the world, but certainly here, we were initially told we have to social distance. And in the weeks that followed, and that essentially meant lockdown and quarantine and isolation. And in the weeks that followed, people started saying, hey, wait a minute, maybe this terminology is wrong. Maybe we should really be talking about physical distancing, not social distancing. We're more social than ever, via social media and other platforms, we can stay connected. We should try to stay connected and even maybe grow our social networks. And that's an important part of coping with the anxiety of this current situation. So let's consider it physical distancing, but let's encourage greater social connection. So I wanna talk for a minute, especially when we think about to what extent physical distancing might be associated with social isolation and loneliness. So when we think about, again, this physical versus social distancing, we also need to think about people for whom maybe that remote social connection isn't possible. So I just wanna encourage you for a minute before I go into that content to think about this question. So when this is over, what are you going to do? What do you miss most? Many people in the US and elsewhere, when they're asked this question, they respond with answers that emphasize social activities and physical connection. For example, hug my mom, right? So we know that social isolation, and we can think again about older adults who may have less access to te technology, who may be particularly isolated at this time. Social isolation is associated with increased morbidity and mortality particularly coronary heart disease and stroke and poor mental health outcomes. So here's a link at the bottom or a reference at the bottom, an overview of systematic reviews on public health consequences of social isolation and loneliness for those of you that are interested in learning more. It's important though that we understand when we're talking about social isolation, it includes both objective social isolation, the actual lack of social ties, and subjective social isolation, the feeling of a lack of engagement with others. So you can be objectively isolated, but not feel a sense of loneliness. And you may be objectively connected to each other, but still feel lonely. So it's important for us to be aware of and checking in with people in our extended social network, and maybe even friends and neighbors, or that may include people that we didn't even know that well before the pandemic, but we worry about, we worry that maybe they don't have family, maybe they don't have someone checking on them, maybe they're particularly isolated at this time. So I think it's also important to think about, as we sort of transition to thinking about the potential detrimental effects of social iso isolation, the potential positive mental health effects of social support, there is a 
rich history of research over the last 15, 20 years, indicating that social support is a very robust predictor of positive mental health outcomes. So that's something that we, again, want to think about as the primary way of effectively coping with the current pandemic and the associated potential anxiety and other feelings, say, of you know, sadness or concern um, that may be cropping up for people. So again, thinking about the resources that are in your region, here is an article on the left-hand side that came out in the US around 57 things to do with friends while social distancing beyond catching up. And so when I looked at this particular list, I thought, okay, well, not all of the 57 appeal to me, but even if 15 or 20 things on this list appeal to me, this is a whole bunch of new ideas that I can use to think about creative ways of connecting with people remotely and playing games and engaging in different activities that I might not have thought of on my own. Really for any interest or hobby or need, there's likely to be an online group. It's relatively easy to connect if you're willing to reach out. And you can think about social media platforms too. There's a lot of online social support groups and that might be for people in your area, for people in your particular age group, for people in your particular circumstances. For example, social support groups for people from particular universities and particular departments and programs. So when we think about social media, I just wanna mention briefly an important factor. So there is research on use of social media and it seems to suggest two important things. One is that increased time spent on social media might actually displace more authentic, engaged social experiences. And particularly for those of us that might be just sort of scrolling through, say, a Facebook feed, we might be exposed to highly idealized representations of our peers' lives, and this may result in a belief that others lead happier or more successful lives. So when you're thinking about engaging with social media, the research is becoming increasingly clear. If you have a passive level of engagement and you are passively viewing others' manicured uh, or idealized representations of their lives, this has potentially detrimental mental health effects. And not only does it have potentially detrimental mental health effects, but it can actually make you increasingly isolated and withdrawn and less likely to connect with people in person. Now, in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic, where we're advised to physically distance, how can we meaning, meaningfully connect through social media? Well, again, things that are active ways of connecting, commenting, engaging, joining uh, support groups through Facebook or other platforms, depending on your preferred platform. I think that this is important. So just thinking about, again, how can you meaningfully engage in an active way and get your social support needs met and give authentic social support to others remote, remotely through these types of platforms. Also, again, thinking about your local area, I'm not sure what's going on, but I can tell you that some examples in the US are really encouraging. And I imagine that there are similar examples in your area. So for example, neighborhoods in the US have increasingly started to come together to check on and support vulnerable members in, in the community. So for example, we have an app, uh, Nextdoor. And this app, Nextdoor, has traditionally been used for neighborhoods to like buy and sell items um, or you know, report different events in the neighborhood. But the Nextdoor app has actually partnered with some of our larger grocery store chains, our food store chains. And the Nextdoor app has enabled uh, many people to sponsor those in their neighborhood that are vulnerable. And they are able to buy and have delivered uh, groceries or you know, other ways of kind of delegating responsibility within the neighborhood for checking on people that some are worried about or that they haven't heard from or older people that are living alone. So this has been really nice because again, neighbors that didn't even know each other before the COVID-19 pandemic are actually starting to get to know one another. Also, a lot of neighborhoods, including my neighborhood, have had bear hunts for kids. So um, many of the houses and apartments have put stuffed animals, bears in the windows, and the kids walk around the neighborhood, again, socially distancing, 
but walk around the neighborhood on a scavenger hunt looking for the bears. And you can get a map online that shows you the different houses where the bears are. Um, on the left-hand side, the bottom, you see a little sticker, hello neighbor, are you self-isolating? Let's connect, here's my name, I live nearby, here's my phone number or text. Can I pick up groceries for you? Can I run an errand for you? Is there anything you need, right? So people are just leaving stickers on one another's doors. So again, you know, think about what's happening in your context in your neighborhood, but there has been a lot of solidarity and social cohesion and, um, you know, collective mobilizing in communities to really support the most vulnerable. Um, a few things as I wrap up. One is that there's been this really great series uh, through the Lancet uh, and Global Health, uh, CUGH, and I've attended several of these webinars. I would encourage you to attend, they're, they're free to attend. A recent webinar on May 5th was around mental health and COVID-19 best practice public health information campaigns. And there were several points that were raised about concerns regarding misinformation, that messaging must be tailored to the needs of specific populations. And we're talking about hygiene messaging around hand washing, uh, social or physical distancing, wearing a mask, that sort of thing. But also it's important that mental health and psychosocial support was mentioned during this particular risk communication webinar as a really critical component that needs to be incorporated into all risk communications regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, there were concerns about how to reach groups that may be less accessible, not online, or have limited access to technology. So again, these are specific to Colorado, but I share these resources because I'd like you to think about what is your local equivalent. So we have uh, local resources in Colorado that provide mental health, but also um, daily support needs, food assistance, utility support, child care information. We have crisis mental health hotlines. We have national suicide prevention hotlines, disaster distress hotlines, national domestic violence hotlines, and increasingly uh, therapists, mental health therapists and social workers and psychologists are offering telemental health, remote mental health services. Also, as I mentioned, I work on a medical campus and the medical campus where I work in the Department of Psychiatry they're running remote support groups, grief groups for adults, parent caregiver support groups, grief groups for adolescents, and they have a number of different resources that are available online. That includes resources for kids and parents, self-care toolkits for coping and whatnot. So again, in ending this, I would just bring it back to this slide that I showed earlier in the presentation and ask you to think about what are some examples of innovative ways that you've stayed socially connected and engaged to your extended network and maybe even grown your network and established new or deeper connections? And what are some examples of coping strategies that you found useful during this challenging time? And what are your thoughts about differences and similarities between the audience of students that I was speaking to, for example, in an earlier version of this presentation I gave versus me giving this presentation now in this forum for those in Mizoram, India and elsewhere. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuddi. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. And uh, I hope that all the participants, you know, uh, enjoyed uh, the talk. And we have some questions here. I think you can read them, Dr. Kudli. So if you sure, can, let me pull those up. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you can answer to those questions, uh, then uh, you know, I think we should just <laughs> immediately start with that because for you sure. it's getting late, you know. <laughs> so uh, we we cannot have Dr. Kudli to uh, throughout the entire session because for her it, it, it would be already twelve o'clock by now p.m. So. Uh, whatever answers and queries uh, you have, let her uh, let, let her uh, have the chance to 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 give her answers now to the Q and A button. It's there, so just check it and whatever answers that you need to give. You can. Sure. Um, well, thank you very much. But I'm actually very interested in seeing the other presentations as well. So I'm I will certainly right. try to stay on and stay away. So thank you. Um, so, well, the one question is why is the U.S. Uh, um, 
I think that there are two strong opposing forces in the US right now. One is comprised of primarily uh, scientists and health practitioners, and many of those are aligned with uh, liberal Democrats, such as myself, to be forthcoming. So that's where I'm situated. You know, I work in a school of public health. My colleagues are epidemiologists and medical practitioners, doctors, nurses, and others. And I think that that force is coming up against a more conservative Republican political force that in many ways, understandably, is driven by the economy. And of course, the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in the US as elsewhere are huge. And there is so much suffering that is continuing to unfold. And of course, there are sweeping mental health implications of the financial suffering. So I don't mean to diminish the concerns of those, particularly Republican groups driven by economic concerns that want to, quote unquote, return to normal. But I think that it's resulting in a lot of conflict and a lot of mixed messaging and what's happened at the federal level is that the responsibility has been delegated to the states and in some cases further delegated to the mayors of cities to decide what to do. So you have a very um, heterogeneous process happening across the US. I'm involved with a research group that received a grant recently through the National Science Foundation, the Rapid Grants Mechanism, to examine um, perception and behaviors around COVID-19 across six US states, looking at how the different approaches by state influence those perceptions and behaviors. And again, we're looking at mental health aspects as well. But I think this is, um, you know, all this is, is to say that it is a very tumultuous time in the US and we do not have uh, any consensus consensus around an approach in terms of leadership. So the federal government compared to Colorado state government and the local municipality, the local city government and the county government are three radically different perspectives. So I don't know if that helps, but I think that that's part of the problem. We, and we don't have coordination that we need here concerning uh, widespread testing and contact tracing that ideally should have been in place for us to consider any kind of opening back up or so-called return to normalcy. Um, I'm not sure how India can control it. Again, I would say that the US federal response is a lesson in what not to do. Um, and I, I hope that other countries that have responded in a more effective manner, including widespread testing and contact tracing, can be an example and a support for one another. Um, yeah, so this mutation issue, I mean, this is a question for some of my colleagues, but I can say that as I've been following the research, I think one of the things that is so confusing, confusing for people is that there's so much ambiguity and uncertainty because even research groups that have historically been researching other types of coronavirus, um, this is, this is you know, it's known as the novel coronavirus, obviously it's performing very differently. We are struggling to answer some pretty basic questions around the r naught, around transmission rates, around reinfection, around immunity. Um, and I think that that's deeply disturbing for people. And as we look at mutations, um, as viruses do tend to mutate, a lot of people in the US in particular have put their hope and faith in the possibility of a vaccine in January. And I'm not sure that that's realistic for many different reasons. Uh, and I think concerns around um, various strains and mutation is part of that. I don't know if I've answered all the questions and I don't wanna take up the time of others. Um, Dr. Henry, do you have any other questions or thoughts about things that you would like me to address? Okay, with that, I think uh, uh, obviously we can't answer to all the uh, questions of the participants and because of, of, of the time constraints. 
and uh, we have to go to the other speaker. Uh, Professor Kalpana will be the other speaker. And with this, uh, maybe later on, if we do have time, then uh, you know, Dr. Kadi also can uh, contribute. Uh, now, let me uh, invite uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Kalp Kalpana from this to continue her topic. Hello, Dr. Kalpana. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Um, I'm experiencing some problems mm. because of the weather here. Um, am I audible? Yes, you're audible, but the video is. Uh, we can't see you. You can. Yep, there I am. There I am. All right. Yeah, uh, very good morning to everybody. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, thanks to the Mizoram University for having uh, organized this uh, session. Uh, Dr. Kirtney, it was an absolute pleasure to listen to you. And um, I'm glad that the Mizoram University has actually given us this uh, opportunity to be able to... I'm just going to... There's some extraneous noise. Can I just... Take a minute to... Uh, Madam, uh, it seems you have two devices logged in at the same time. That's right, that's right. Yeah, you need to log out from one of the devices. I have done that, yes. Oh, yes, it, it's coming fine now, Madam. It's now fine, yeah. Yes, I've just yes, done fine. that, yeah. Thank you. I think there is just a bit of a problem with my... She seems to be having some internet problem. Let's just, just wait for a few seconds. Hopefully she'll be back. Okay. Uh, in the meanwhile, while uh, uh, Dr. Kalpana is attending to the her network problem, uh, let's just uh, go over what you know Dr. Kirby has presented, and yeah. we have seen that you know. Hello. Yeah. Dr. I, Kalpana. I, I, okay. Okay. Go ahead. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. No, no, you continue. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I mean, I, you know, I'm actually taking off from where Dr. Kirtney had uh, said about all of us being in the same. Uh, storm and not necessarily in the same boat and I couldn't agree more. Uh, I would also say that we all travel in different boats of different sizes with different kinds of coping strategies and uh, the ability for us to be able to deal with uh, you know the issues of uh, this is uh, extremely uh, challenging for most of us. I'm sharing the screen and I hope that is visible now. Is the screen visible? Okay. Just try, I'm just try it again. Just try it again. It's not visible. Is that yes, visible? Now it's visible. Yes, now it's visible. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, try and go through this and not allow technology to beat us down so badly uh, because there is a bit of an inclement weather here in Guwahati. But uh, basically, you know, the, the flow of the talk should have actually been that, you know, we talk about mental health, why it matters, what we are doing about it. And then ideally, we could have had Dr. Kirtney, um, you know, talk about the practical strategies. But we've been extremely uh, delighted to have her with us. And therefore, we wanted her to begin because it's already well into her, the night. So I, I think she's made it a lot uh, easier for me to really set the stage about why we are talking about the magnitude of the uh, issues over here. And uh, I'll try and see that, uh, you know, we talk a little bit 
uh, more about what we need to be doing and what we have been doing in India, perhaps uh, to share some of the uh, kinds of experiences that we have had. So what do we actually expect in this session? Uh, I'm hoping that by the end of this, and I'm also extremely conscious of the fact that we have a very uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, you know, group over here in the audience, so we are not talking as social workers from the Department of Social Work at Mizoram University or at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences or at Colorado to just social workers. And so, uh, we, you know, we are not talking to even just mental health professionals. So very briefly, perhaps what I was hoping to achieve is talk about the importance of the magnitude of uh, mental health in the current uh, times of the lockdown when the entire world has been locked down, what does it do to our mental health? Uh, move basically from trying to understand what happens at an individual level towards the family and what happens in the context of the family. A lot of this, I will be drawing references back to Dr. Courtney's uh, uh, talk as well. And then moving from the family to the community uh, and in the context of the community, why is it important that we talk in terms of mental health and then moving to the nation and then the global context. So that's the flow in which I've uh, tried to organize this uh, talk. Uh, hopefully we'll also get some time to talk about, you know, the short term consequences on mental health and the long term consequences of the entire, uh, you know, scenario on mental health and then address what is there in the title of the uh, uh, presentation which says you know what needs to be done and how do we get it done or what is being done already about it. Uh, so to begin very uh, briefly I mean I know that we all have very internalized understandings of what mental health is uh, but just so that we are on the same page I thought that it might be nice to uh, to emphasize and there has been no time in the last few decades perhaps more important than this one uh, which tells us that we cannot be talking about health without discussing mental health and uh, mental health being a very, very integral part of uh, how we look at health. Uh, although the WHO definition has for decades already talked about uh, health being you know, a composite uh, understanding in terms of the physical, the social, the psychological, uh, as well as the spiritual, uh, we have kind of um, not paid the due uh, attention to mental health, although for the last 20 or 30 years, uh, we have been talking about uh, the fact that the next inevitably uh, largest uh, uh, you know, uh, problems that we're going to be facing is with regard to mental health. And uh, so it's almost being called the next inevitable pandemic. Uh, the terms pandemic, inevitable, we've added to a whole lot of our lexicon in the last 60 days alone. Uh, we've all come to understand and uh, attribute meaning to various things that we have been hearing. Uh, but just so that we are on the same page, uh, you know, a, probably a little bit of an understanding from a definitional point of view uh, of what mental health is. And um, when we are saying mental health, at least for the purpose of this presentation and for most of our uh, uh, work, we are saying it's a state of well-being in which the individual is able to realize his or her own abilities. Very importantly, that the individual is able to cope with the normal stresses of life uh, and can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So we can see that you know mental health is uh, something that uh, uh, all of us uh, probably possess. It's a resource. It's a set of energies that we uh, have. And when we are talking about mental health, it's also important for us to understand that the etiology or the causation of problems or challenges that we face in our mental health have to do both with, um, have to do with the biological, the psychological and the social aspects. Uh, so therefore, the management also becomes equally important that we look at it from a biological, a psychological and a social uh, aspect. And the Therefore, the role of social environmental stressors cannot be uh, overemphasized. We know that uh, a number of stressors that do exist, even in regular times, and we have not even begun talking about what has happened after the uh, COVID-19 scenario, 
Even before that, we have had a number of stressors that we uh, have faced, which impact uh, people's men uh, mental health, which affects their capacity to cope. And just for the purpose of this uh, uh, presentation, I thought it's also important that we highlight, although all of us do understand uh, these terms, that we are not referring to you know, mental health as uh, in relation to just mental illness. Mental illness or the absence of it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that we have uh, sound mental health. And I think that's a position that uh, most of us uh, relate with. If we look at just the last three days, in terms of the headlines, and we look at the kind of uh, information that's coming out from the WHO, that's come, that's being uh, announced from the United Nations, uh, from various international bodies. Everybody is talking about the alarm that this scenario is now raising in terms of its impact on mental health. Uh, we have the WHO Director General statement, which says that the impact of the pandemic on people's mental health is already extremely concerning. Uh, we have uh, uh, experts who say that the pandemic plan for mental health is too small and that suicides have already started increasing. Uh, this is a study, uh, it's, not, it's not a study, but I mean, it has been reported that uh, out of, uh, 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 you know, all the non-corona virus deaths that have taken place even in the last few weeks in our country, uh, the leading cause among that has been very tragically suicide, uh, highlighting again the importance or the need for us to be concerned about the mental health in this context. Uh, some of the greatest causes of misery, uh, the UN warns of pandemic mental health costs, the uh, fact that the virus is not just attacking our physical health, people have been talking about the shock, the uh, levels of um, uh, you know, challenge that people face when they have, uh, and Dr. Courtney had also mentioned that about the loss of jobs uh, for people, it's already a reality that is uh, staring them in the face. Uh, isolation, restrictions on movements, and all of this uh, is happening all over the world. But like we said very, uh, you know, uh, a little earlier, the fact that it is happening all over the world is one thing that we can all relate with. But the fact that different populations across the world have different capacities to adapt and to be able to cope with the challenges that they are facing are very varied. And with that, the kinds of impact that it can have on mental health on different populations, therefore, uh, becomes also varied. And uh, when we look at, uh, so this is the, the figures that I was uh, referring to, and this was um, a study uh, that was being reported out of India. I think it was in the, uh, it was a newspaper report. So this is somebody who has put down uh, looking at reports as to what are the kinds of challenges and 168 out of 326 non-coronavirus deaths till 9th May were due to suicides. Very, very alarming uh, for us. Uh, statistics have a way of, you know, telling us very decisively what uh, is actually happening and 792 million people already lived with a mental health disorder or with mental health challenges in a study that was done, global study that was done in 2017. We're talking about pre-COVID uh, times. Uh, this is, even at that time, it was slightly more than one in 10 people globally. Today, uh, for the last 20 years or 30 years, we have been saying that uh, by 2030, depression is going to be one of the leading uh, health challenges that people will face. And uh, today with the COVID-19 scenario, uh, we are finding that uh, the reality is, uh, you know, very sharply uh, being defined. Uh, without going into too much of technical or, you know, uh, uh, language uh, related to psychiatry, but for us to understand that both depression and anxiety uh, as two of the major or the more common kinds of uh, illnesses, are uh, something that we are already talking about. Depression affects almost 264 million people in the world. Uh, and for most of these people, the mental health conditions start at a very young age. They start as young as, uh, you know, um, uh, in their teens, uh, between 15 to 29. And when we are talking about depression and we are using a terminology like depression, we are not 
talking about the usual mood fluctuations that many of us might be familiar with uh, based on various stressors that we might face. Uh, we are talking about a condition which is important for us to recognize because at the extreme end of this uh, mental health condition is the risk for uh, suicide, uh, which we are already beginning to see. And uh, when it comes to uh, anxiety, and again, uh, you know, it's very normal for us to feel disturbed and to feel anxious when uh, we face a lot of pressure. But we are referring to anxiety disorders when we have a certain set of uh, symptoms that we associate with it. And uh, in terms of anxiety disorders, our statistics say that about 289 million people worldwide are affected by anxiety disorders. And like I was saying, these are all, you know, even before we have started uh, recognizing the importance that COVID has created on this. Now, um, uh, this is uh, something that was there in the mental health promotion book and it overemphasizes for us as social workers, as social scientists, uh, the need to look at mental health uh, with a psychosocial lens and understanding that uh, there are individual factors that can, uh, at the bottom of the screen to the left, uh, that can uh, you know, predispose a person to having a mental health challenge. There are social support and other interactions which, and all these uh, factors like societal structures and resources, cultural values and uh, contexts within which we operate, the, the dynamic interaction between these two really leading to uh, sound mental health or otherwise. Uh, so uh, when we talk about the disability adjusted uh, life years, that is the number of years that a person might lose because of a mental health uh, problem, uh, we see that uh, it, you know, mental and behavioral disorders represented almost 11% of the total disease burden. And way back in 1990, uh, the interagency uh, group that works on, uh, uh, and the IASC guidelines that works on mental health and psychosocial support in all emergencies and uh, in all disasters. And so therefore we are looking at COVID-19 also as a disaster as it rightly should be looked at. Uh, we are saying that um, um, this is a, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a composite term and we are we're talking about uh, any type of local or outside support that aims to protect or promote psychosocial well-being. Now, when we are talking about this pandemic and mental health, um, we are saying that the pandemic causes concern due to time lapse the lack of preparedness, because when it suddenly arrives on you and we are all aware of the level of shock that we had and very disbelievingly, we all moved into uh, a phase where we had to adapt to changing scenarios, to changing guidelines that were being announced, uh, advocacy of different measures. So the time lapse to prepare you for um, you know, the kind of life changes that we've all had to make, uh, several lifestyle changes, has been extremely um, uh, you know, difficult. And the mental health burden on healthcare workers uh, causes its own concern. The human resource crunch that happens, uh, the quarantine, the social isolations uh, that are being recommended, uh, mental health burdens that have increased. And uh, all of this has led to um, you know, certain measures that have been advocated to basically stop the spread of transmission. Now, the terminology that uh, Dr. Kurtney and I think now the WHO also has stopped using the terminology of social distance, distancing and referring to it as physical distancing, which is what it was right from the beginning. Because I think it's very important that in a, a pandemic like this, that we remain socially connected despite having a physical distancing. So the physical distancing is important to stop the spread of the disease. But the social uh, connectedness uh, is an extremely important aspect uh, that is required. And the lockdown and the resultant resource crunch, all of the measures that have come up in the context of this pandemic, more so than in any other pandemic in the past, uh, they've, they've made us realize that in its own way, all these measures also add to the mental health burden. Uh, while they are seen as necessary and arguably so by a lot of people that there are uh, reasons as to why one needs to stay at home, 
one needs to start working from home or working at home, uh, the quarantining that is occurring and all of this, I'll, I'll, like I said, arguably, if that is considered as an uh, advocated measure, uh, it also impacts mental health. And that is the significance of uh, why mental health burden goes up uh, in a time like this. It's not just the disease itself, uh, but the coronavirus uh, spread uh, itself, but the advocated measures which add to it. A third level of uh, burdening that occurs uh, is the contagion of information. There's so much information out there and one doesn't really know uh, what is uh, fake and what is real. And uh, with this kind of information, if the cartoon is uh, visible, which is uh, there, uh, you know, we've got this big file boxes which say too much information, not enough and just right. Very difficult to really make out what is just right. You know, how much information is just right? And uh, do we just need to be on a need to know basis? Or do we need to, uh, you know, know a little more so that we can be better prepared? And how much of this are we able to uh, take in and uh, be able to change our behavior thereafter? So what are the kinds of issues that come up in um, a pandemic like this? One, there are already general health related fears during a pandemic. We, when we started with, uh, in, in different points of time in different countries, uh, we had different start dates. But for us, if we were to go back to March, mid-March and then the uh, lockdown after the 22nd onwards, uh, I think even in the worst nightmares, and this is what a lot of people keep telling us, even in the worst of the nightmares, they would not have imagined that there could be a lockdown that could have this kind of an effect. And it affects us in extremely different ways because we belong to different places even within a country like India. And, um, uh, you know, whether it's not just about which zone your, uh, is being marked out in your uh, area, uh, everybody is affected. And that is the single most important thing for us to recognize that uh, in a pandemic as uh, big as this, everybody is affected. There's nobody who is not affected. It doesn't really matter if you do not have too much of a morbidity or too much of mortality occurring because of that, or we have managed to control uh, the spread, but we remain affected. Now, one of the fears that people have is uh, people who have had systemic health issues. You know, what happens to their regular medication? Uh, the fear of the ability to secure medical advice if needed. Uh, the la and not related to COVID, I'm, I'm talking about other general health problems, the lack of access to health uh, care facilities, the lack of availability of medicines, um, several disruptions, the lack of transport uh, that is available in any given city, uh, you know, choices that people would have wanted to make, elective surgeries, elective uh, choices that people would have made, now all have to be deferred. And uh, the fear of going to a hospital has you know, only added to all the other fears that people have. And in addition to that, there are mental health disturbances that are related to COVID-19 itself. And that is the fear of contraction of illness and or its spread, the fear of being responsible for its spread. Uh, in the last uh, few uh, weeks, you know, we've been uh, engaged in uh, one or the other initiative when it comes to psychosocial support and uh, mental health. And uh, one of the you know, uh, things that repeatedly come up uh, in discussion is, you know, I'm so scared that by my behavior, I'll be considered irresponsible. And so therefore, you know, I'm not going out at all, even if I have to do it for an emergency. So the fear of dying or that of loved ones dying, um, probably a little more of assurance that people have now, but in the, in the earlier part, uh, of the uh, phase of lockdown, that is uh, lockdown 1.0, there was a lot of fears that were expressed. Fears of having to go to a hospital and getting infected. Uh, guilt, if, if infected. Uh, shame. A lot of people who go to great pains take to WhatsApp or social, other social media networks to tell people that, you know, uh, I have been wrongly accused. We've had a series of such messages saying that I've been wrongly accused of having been irresponsible in my behavior, but I haven't really uh, been going out because there's so much of stigma and uh, anger that uh, people face, feel collectively. And uh, so there's anger that's directed at self or at others who are infected. 
uh, we saw in parts people hoarding materials and resources all in their inability to be able to cope with the fears that they were feeling uh, feeling powerless over issue the resources crunch the fact that i do not have uh, the control you know in a very ironic way people were saying that this is a very great leveler but uh, uh, it's not really still a leveler because there are people who feel differently vulnerable based on the kind of background the socio economic background that they come from then losing out on relationships in real time um, inability to manage relationships due to uh, the home quarantining working at home and working from home suddenly being imposed as uh, a guideline for all of us to uh, you know adapt to has not been easy for most people uh, the anxiety about the need for hospitalization the uh, women getting further pressured and burdened uh, very little has been really talked about in terms of uh, women and how they are coping uh, it's not simply about domestic violence it's also about the fact that women are increasingly feeling more pressured and burdened now that uh, they are being at home then caregiver anxieties for uh, caregivers for children for older persons for persons with disabilities persons with mental illness uh, there is already a huge burden of people who are uh, experiencing with mental illness and what happens to them when they are uh, completely uh, at home and the immediate impact therefore of the covid-19 with the lockdown uh, 3.0 now is about the anxiety about the future about work about family about uh, travel i mean there's so many issues that people are uh, grappling with but the worst is not yet over because there are possible long term consequences on mental health as well what happens to people's uh, ability to uh, cope and will the fear of contamination still persist long after we have been able to uh, with some degree of success or some measure of success uh, overcome the covid-19 uh, the discrimination in communities towards some others unfortunately may continue so therefore as mental health professionals as concerned citizens i think we need to be concerned about this uh, so therefore the terminologies that we need to be already very particular about not calling people cases or calling people covid-19 case or uh, you know referring to them in derogatory terms uh, even uh, the suspicion that some people might be carrying uh, the infection uh, leads to a lot of discrimination and uh, stigma the irrational fear about health persists people get extremely particular about being uh, sanitized the difficulty in getting a job having lost one a poor ability at all levels micro level to meso level to macro level to recover from economic losses and the violence within the home increasing as a fallout of larger macro disturbances so these are some of our concerns that we that will possibly persist even after we have seen um, you know the covid uh, 19 uh, peak flatten and after we have been able to successfully probably get rid of it at some point in time but these are concerns that we are uh, you know uh, having that will po possibly persist um so uh, the deterioration of uh, and these have been again in a briefing note of the iasc reference group these have been referred to as some of the possible long term consequences that we need to already be prepared for and that is the deterioration of social networks uh, local dynamics economies the stigma towards surviving uh, patients resulting in rejection possible anger and aggression against the government and frontline workers unfortunately we've already begun seeing this this note was put out in march uh, at the end of march and uh, we are already seeing that this is a reality and the possible mistrust of information provided by government and authorities and to add to that maybe i could say that the, the even the mistrust that we have amongst ourselves uh, as a community can also be one of the concerns Uh, the second pandemic is the term given uh, in the world economic forum to talk about the economic losses being almost as huge as the covid-19 itself and the resultant mental health impact uh, very very unfortunately we know that people have already begun losing jobs uh, people are getting laid off work uh, uh, a lot of uh, institutions educational institutions have 
uh, shut down. There are at a time when students were possibly embarking on a career path. And all of this is likely to uh, result in greater uh, levels of stress, uh, which uh, Dr. Curtin has already uh, referred to. So what, what is important for us to probably understand is that anxiety is a very normal reaction to any uncertainty. And it's all right to feel anxious. It's, uh, you know, and we do feel anxious. We do feel sad. We do feel a lot of these emotions. But the concern here is that people without an earlier history of anxiety may begin to experience anxiety now in the context of COVID-19. And when it is uh, too much of anxiety that the individual uh, has uh, experienced, then the resultant uh, effects on sleep, on appetite, on exercise, on work, and all of that probably then leading to what we would refer to as a clinically diagnosable condition like generalized anxiety disorder, which has uh, a whole lot of these uh, symptoms that we see. Uh, so that is one of the concerns. Similarly, with, de uh, with depression, and uh, the, the common signs and symptoms that we would see are about the disturbances to mood, uh, to affect, to cognition, to physical energies and physiological uh, status. So all of these are uh, things that people have already begun experiencing and they have already uh, begun talking about. The, uh, there is the Association of Psychiatric Social Work uh, uh, Professionals, which has uh, been actually, uh, which has actually been uh, running a helpline right at the, from the very start on, uh, of this. And we find a lot of people who ring up to say that, you know, they're not sure if they are depressed, but they are beginning to feel a little, uh, uh, you know, sad and their mood has changed and a sense of frustration, a sense of hopelessness and all of that. Now, what we need to um, actually uh, talk about is, Specifically, we know that it affects everybody. We know that every one of us is affected, but unfairly, some of us have a greater burden of mental health as compared to some others, largely because of the kind of coping mechanisms and the social support that we tend to enjoy. Uh, so pandemics of this proportion affect everybody, and we know that no one is untouched. But if we were to look at specifically the groups that uh, we, um, I'm trying to go from the individual to groups to the community. We find that uh, whether it's uh, in the context of men and older adults, we need to uh, address these issues and see what is the the concern. What are the concerns with each of them? Uh, with the marginalized groups, the poor, migrants, all of us are familiar with in India of migrant and daily wage uh, workers going back on foot uh, we, uh, you know, and having to reach home, have, being separated from families and the kind of uh, psychosocial distress that it causes. Uh, going beyond the binary of gender, what happens to the LGBTQI uh, community? Uh, people, and then people who are poor or who have no access to resources, even in the normal times, so-called normal times. And then people who, who are separated from family, Consideration of special populations like persons with disability, persons living with HIV AIDS, persons living with mental illness, substance abusers, uh, what happens to these people in the context of lockdown and uh, what is likely to happen. So when we are talking about children and here I may not go into uh, too, mu too much of detail, but uh, the, you know, because it has already been covered partly and I I'm sure Dr. Henry will also probably go into a little bit of uh, details about this, but the needs and concerns of infants, uh, when you have so much of extra work at home, uh, do the infants get neglected? Uh, the kinds of issues and concerns that parenting uh, has uh, you know, been uh, challenged with, the fact that the children who used to go to school in families where children are fortunate to go to schools are now not at school, and so how do you keep them engaged? Uh, children with disabilities do not have the same kind of access to uh, a lot of issues, including uh, say hand wash and sanitation and hygiene uh, practices. Uh, so are we you know, looking at those uh, concerns also? What is happening to our children who are in institutions? Uh, 
the lack of access to technology to assist learning. Uh, one of the greatest uh, you know, challenges that people are facing now when you have physical dis distancing is uh, using modes of communication, which all children do not really have access to. And the worst access is for children in the lower socioeconomic households. But what we can be doing at a time like this, since this is also what the scope of the uh, lecture is, that is about managing the anxieties, engaging with children, family, uh, using the time for family bonding, uh, giving correct information uh, and uh, providing opportunities where you can contact friends of your, the children at home and be able to put them in touch so that they are not completely left out of that uh, uh, social uh, Stimulus, uh, stimulus. The as far as youth are concerned, a tremendous uh, set of problems. College-going youth, uh, we are facing, uh, you know, huge challenges for them. Uh, never before has the digital, the digital divide been so challenging as it is now. So when we want to conduct classes for students who are in a range of places, we find that not everybody is even in a village where you might have electricity. And not everybody has a laptop. Uh, if you have a laptop, you may have an internet connection. You may not have a strong internet connection. So what happens to education is uh, being increasingly uh, discussed. And I uh, know that all of us in all our different universities are applying ourselves to see how do we uh, ensure that learning opportunities are not lost for students who are there. Uh, another big challenge uh, for students, uh, not just students, but people who are graduating, who are taking up jobs, is the fact that jobs are becoming fewer and the job market is uh, laying off a lot of people. And these are people who might be beginning careers or who are losing out on uh, certain uh, employment opportunities. So all of this uncertainty, again, like we said, we need to be concerned about how do we address it when it comes to uh, mental health. Uh, you know, I'm trying to just focus on one or two issues in each of these categories, and it's not an exhaustive list. There are a lot of rural, uh, uh, you know, areas in which youth will face probably very, very many more severe uh, challenges. Uh, uh, but then we come back to, again, uh, different uh, categories, and we are talking about women, the multiple burdens of work at home and for work from home. Uh, uh, the fact that you know you, you now have women being locked in to the house uh, into the house and uh, women who are uh, unfortunately more and more helplines are beginning to register that there are uh, and that's again always the tip of the iceberg of more and more calls coming in uh, for the, uh, complaining about uh, domestic violence and uh, so this is a huge concern that uh, is there and i know that the National Commission for Women has launched a WhatsApp number in India. We have almost 52 helplines for uh, women which are out in India. In different uh, states, it will be good to find out for most of us, uh, you know, how do women access uh, mental health uh, support or uh, psychosocial support in their places. Uh, very often, we leave men out of this kind of discussion and we don't really consider them a uh, vulnerable group and we are talking about other social challenges but I think in a, a scenario like this only because of the fact that it is like we said a level of uh, everybody is uh, facing different kinds of challenges and the loss of jobs uh, for men working from home not ideal situations because skill capacities are different and uh, living arrangements are so different so that it's not easy for a person to deliver the kind of quality of work that one could have done from uh, a workspace uh, now at home and the economic insecurity, the law, the higher expenditures that have occurred because of uh, the lockdown period uh, with all the prices rising and this adding to the economic losses that people have uh, faced. Older adults uh, or older persons, uh, the concerns and anxieties of them living alone, living with disabilities, uh, not being able to access uh, healthcare facilities or caregivers uh, even and uh, all of these are uh, and especially because the advisories are that they should be uh, you know completely physically distant uh, and protected uh, therefore the concerns are 
even more so. Other groups like migrant workers, daily wage labor, uh, laborers, uh, persons with disability, adults with intellectual disabilities, uh, homeless persons, persons belonging to different communities, persons living with HIV AIDS, sex workers, uh, single women, orphans, uh, people who are orphaned, uh, persons belonging to the LGBTQ community and uh, refugees, they, uh, according to reports, experience the highest degree of socioeconomic marginalization, even at a time like this. So the fear of losing your livelihood, not being able to work during isolation, the fear of being dismissed from work, uh, being socially excluded, placed in uh, quarantine, the, the powerlessness, uh, the frustration, and the fear of falling ill and uh, dying. And for persons with disability, because we have very little disaggregated data, we are unable to really know what is the situation and, uh, uh, and also that they are unable to access information and communicate as easily because of the several uh, environmental barriers that are there. The fact that there is lack of accessible public transit uh, system and uh, limited capacity of health workers also to communicate and work with persons with disability, even in the best of times. Um, so uh, these are uh, some of the things what we should be doing, uh, raising awareness, reaching out to local organizations, looking at our own uh, states, cities, districts, villages where we work, seeing how we can build networks, connecting to the resources and accessing the right sources of information um, is I think uh, very important. Uh, also that mental health uh, services and individual providers, uh, I'll just give a very brief uh, example for, ex uh, uh, you know, a lot of people have started helplines and uh, the Association of Psychiatric Social Work uh, Professionals had also started a helpline very uh, long back and I think there have been almost 700 calls that have been received uh, from various people and depending on which state uh, the helpline has been accessed, uh, different kinds of queries have uh, come up, but uh, a lot of them also have to do with uh, how do we access mental health services now that we uh, you know, uh, are not allowed to go out. Uh, in addition, uh, different state governments and uh, others have started telepsychological counseling or telepsychosocial uh, support. Uh, similarly, the uh, state of Assam, where uh, I am located, has also uh, begun, they have, they have had guidelines for uh, telepsychological counseling and they have uh, enlisted uh, or are enlisting about 600 volunteers who will be able to be first line uh, you know contacts for people who have uh, issues and then they are trained in a package of uh, uh, training to be able to refer the uh, ones that they cannot handle to mental health professionals so that a large number of issues of socioeconomic concerns or uh, problems related to psychosocial distress can be handled by these groups of volunteers. So uh, I'm just here, uh, you know, trying to address uh, the uh, social work departments and psychology departments. And I'm sure in almost every state, uh, it must have started by now. But these are things that we all can do to be able to uh, uh, help uh, people with their mental health issues. Uh, the government, uh, what the government can do is to provide financial safety nets, uh, housing related, unemployment uh, support, emergency loans. These are all advocated measures. Government public health responses, uh, most of the national health missions across the country have been uh, you know, activated uh, to uh, work in this area. And um, uh, you know, issues and concerns that have come up about people who uh, have been uh, taking alcohol and have been abusing alcohol and have been requiring treatment, uh, what do they do in the uh, scenario of a lockdown? And so uh, about, uh, you know, what kind of concerns we should be having for people who have been uh, accessing services as substance abusers is also important. Uh, so therefore, there is the role of the government, there is a role of the NGOs that are there, civil society institutions, providing financial safety nets, uh, beginning Online groups and support groups, extremely important for those of us who are digitally connected. I know that it still doesn't address a large part of India, but for those of us who are, uh, we, um, I think this is one kind of help that has already been an, uh, of tremendous uh, importance. Some of the resources that uh, we thought, and I'm acknowledging here the APS 
WP's uh, uh, members who have actually put these uh, things together as well as the NIMHANS. So we have the Government of India resources, the uh, Niti Ayo government, uh, the Indian Red Cross Society, I Volunteer, which is also uh, there, and I Call, which is a helpline which um, is uh, offered by the Tata Institute of Social Sciences uh, since 2012 or so. And so they have uh, always had calls uh, that were being received and I Call is another such call. Similarly, like we said, there is the APSWP's helpline, there is the IACP, which is the Indian Association of Clinical Psychology's uh, helpline. We have the NIMHANS uh, website advisories if you were to look at the NIMHANS website you will find um, a number of guidelines on uh, in relation to parenting and management of children management of uh, you know other uh, issues so these are some of the uh, uh, like we said the Indian Association of Clinical Psychologists the uh, Association for Psychiatric Social Work Professionals and the NCW list of helplines for women in particular uh, there are some uh, numbers that are also available. So what is uh, probably a takeaway at the end of uh, this lecture as I'm concluding is that psychosocial support and mental health is very important for all of us. Uh, like we have been saying earlier that it is everybody is affected. So therefore it's everybody's business to get to address it. And uh, it's important that we maintain social contact with people who might be isolated uh, even if it's in your neighborhood, even if it's uh, somebody in your own uh, building, is it possible to uh, reach out to them, find out if people are doing okay, because you know in your neighborhood who stays alone and what kind of support systems people have or don't have. Sharing key factual messages with the community. Very important that we send the right kind of messages, uh, especially for individuals who don't use social media. And in a country like ours, that becomes even more important because not everybody has access to social media. So do we know that everybody is getting the right kind of information besides what the government is doing? And providing care and support to people who have been separated from their families. And when do you refer someone for mental health support when you feel that I am not able to uh, cope with this, but I need to refer this person when you feel that a person is unable to cope with whatever resources she or he has. Uh, when these disturbances affect all aspects of the person's functioning, when relationships of this individual are affected, when existing mental health conditions get exacerbated, when uh, being at home it has uh, increased, and when persons with substance abuse are experiencing withdrawal symptoms, or you are assessing that somebody who is looking depressed is also possibly potentially at risk for suicide. Uh, these are the times that uh, we don't try and handle it on our own and we, um, uh, uh, we actually refer them. Since I'm talking, uh, you know, and this is organized by the Department of Social Work at Mizoram University and since I also belong to a school of social work and Dr. Kurtney is also there, I thought I should uh, just add a couple of slides on social work to say that, you know, how do we actually come together as departments of social work to uh, address these issues? And so uh, just a couple of slides about how psychiatric social workers can provide training for social workers, uh, social workers in the community help identify people with need and social workers are able to connect persons with resources and make referrals wherever it is necessary and uh, recognize that there is gender-based violence that is occurring. Listen to people, a lot of uh, uh, help can be already communicated if you are able to listen attentively. Identify people through your listening as to who requires support, helping people understand their reactions, make referrals and advocating within uh, social services and organizing communities to ensure availability of essentials. We've had wonderful models even within India and uh, where different states where people have come together, uh, Kerala being one of the leading examples of how uh, people have come together to uh, organize services and uh, make sure that the most vulnerable, the most marginalized are reached out to. A state like Mizoram where I have worked for 12 years and I consider it a blessing and a, you know uh, the fact that I have been there uh, it has always been a state with 
a very, very high level of civil society consciousness. So uh, even in, a, uh, in, the, in regular times, uh, the concern that people have for the neighborhood and the community and the lack of just having the self uh, as uh, the focus uh, has been something which is very striking and extremely unique. And so therefore, in a time like this, these are the kind of resources that we need to draw uh, on. And uh, to sum up, um, and I hope, uh, Henry, I've kept to my time and I've not exceeded it. Uh, uh, so just to sum up that we've been basically talking about the need to understand psychosocial support, mental health needs, discuss the sources of why we get disturbed further in a pandemic like this, what could be the short and the long-term possible consequences and what we need to do. And um, so this is just a slide of acknowledgements to uh, the Mizoram University for organizing this, the Vice Chancellor, the Department of Social Work, Dr. Henry in particular for organizing this uh, lecture and the participants for uh, you know, being uh, here and uh, look forward to interacting and the uh, APSWP members and office bearers. And that's it. Delightful, delightful presentation as always. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kalpana. Uh, we can wait for the question and answer series. And if sure. any participants uh, wish to uh, give any questions, please, uh, push the question and answer button and then and then accordingly dr kalpana will uh, give her answers in the meanwhile uh, you know we have with us our honorable vice chancellor so i'd just like to invite him to just say a few words uh, about his uh, concerns about you know mental health aspects uh, as well as this uh, you know pandemic yes sir uh, good morning everyone uh, good morning. Uh, respected Madam uh, Kalpana and uh, um, uh, Dr. Colton from USA, uh, it is very uh, wonderful presentation. I was really uh, amazed to see that on the uh, the kind of presentation which you gave and concerned about the various social issues. Uh, it was really good, and uh, I feel that uh, our students are very much benefited by this particular uh, webinar. Uh, on uh, uh, that's uh, COVID uh, shifting uh, various social issues and uh, paradigm shift in various uh, issues in the particular scenario. It was really uh, very hard. Uh, uh, that is a hard situation for everyone. In this particular situation, uh, everyone is uh, suffering, and uh, uh, but uh, everyone is maintaining the minimum social uh, regulations and. Uh, they are helping the government and also the society not to have any spread of this particular uh, pandemic virus. It was really good uh, collective approach of the whole country, uh, particularly in maintaining this uh, uh, various social regulations uh, to stop the chain uh, of spreading the whole country and uh, in a pandemic situation. And uh, I'm really uh, happy that India is one of the country in the whole world actually has been become a model for uh, particularly controlling this virus uh, in a very systematic way. Uh, Dr. Cotton and, uh, uh, and also Dr. Kalpana Madam was really uh, very pertinent and also real. Uh, uh, it is uh, understood the importance of the social uh, implications of this particular virus to have a control. And it was really uh, awareness uh, for all of us uh, through these two eminent people. And I congratulate Dr. Henry for this organization of uh, webinar. And I congr uh, thank Madam uh, Kalpana and also Dr. Kartin. Uh, our students and also because and we are happy about your help to our university. Thank you very much, madam. 
Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, you know, our Vice Chancellor has always been very, very supportive, especially, uh, you know, uh, not especially because, of course, he has a lot of things to think about <laughs> with regards to other departments also, but I'd like to say that, you know, like he his, his concern about the initiatives taken uh, by our department is, is, is always, you know, very important for him. And, and obviously, without his support, we would not have come up with this program. And of course, even uh, our head of department, you know, Professor Kanagaraj and uh, Professor Devendran and my other colleagues also have been always, always very supportive. And I think there are some questions given. Uh, and then can you check yes. them? Uh, yes. yes, yes. So like, uh, yeah, you can kind of, you know, like wind up the questions in such a way that you, you give an answer, you know, in, in just one shot. Sure. Um, so very quickly, there was one question about uh, the difference between stress and anxiety, right? And uh, uh, you know, are they the same? Uh, and because they were referring to also what Dr. Kurtney had said, that not all stress is uh, bad. And that's absolutely correct. Uh, very quickly, if I have to uh, tell you that um, Hans Selye is the person who's actually talked about stress. And uh, uh, we have concepts like uh, positive uh, stressors, which are referred to as eustress and, uh, you know, distress. So we do differentiate and say that not all stress is bad because if I'm not feeling stressed and pressured to uh, write an exam, I may not be motivated to work really hard. And so therefore, we say that uh, there are positive, uh, there is a concept of positive stress also. Uh, interestingly, and I'll tell this very quickly, but the uh, Holmes and Rahe scale, which uh, has you know a number of stressors, uh, does list even in the top 10, uh, positive stressors like marriage as being uh, a marriage is a very positive event, but at the same time, it can cause a lot of stress. And uh, then there are, of course, other kinds of stresses like the loss of a job or the loss of all that which we are experiencing now. So to put it uh, very uh, quickly, that was the uh, answer to that. Uh, with reference to the uh, question on people in the medical profession, uh, how and by which process do they their anxiety in this situation. Yes, healthcare workers and frontline workers uh, have to be protected very, very uh, uh, importantly. And, um, you know, they, uh, how do they protect themselves? Firstly, through the physical measures, but in terms of helplines, I think uh, there have been a lot of uh, helplines that have actually come up to address uh, some of these issues, not enough uh, across our country, but uh, definitely there are resources that are available and like I had put down already uh, in the slides uh, but how do they face their uh, reduce their anxiety I think it is only with uh, you know there is a certain degree of exposure that they have which is much higher than other people and so therefore the measures that will have to be taken there are many kinds of both relaxation techniques as well as uh, other uh, measures that can be advocated for them uh, you uh, then there's a anonymous attendee who has written that people are facing stigma, even the person suffering from viral fever and other people start ignoring this, even if the doctors do the same, how can the stigma be reduced? Uh, so uh, I'm very thankful for that question and I am taking it up only because it's very important that we recognize that this uh, pandemic is going to lead to these kinds of stigma, unfortunately, like we saw even with the HIV AIDS scenario, which happened. And uh, so even if it's just a viral fever or every, every time somebody even coughs, I think Dr. Henry and I were talking yesterday and if I just coughed, you know, the alarm is immediately as to what the uh, issue is. And it can lead to, um, you know, uh, uh, on the, a serious note, it can lead to a lot of uh, such uh, concerns. So therefore, the only suggestion that I would say is to be able to address it through raising the right kind of awareness and building a supportive community. Uh, and that is why I took the example of uh, Mizoram, you know, and uh, communities like that where people come together and are able to uh, uh, mean that. Uh, there is somebody who has asked me what uh, LGBTQ means and that is uh, we are referring to uh, 
people with other sexual orientations and other things so that the lesbian gay bisexual trans persons and uh, queer and uh, then there is someone who has rightly pointed out that there are 10000 injecting drug users and there's been a lot of suicide attempt and death related uh, relating uh, drugs dose during this lockdown how do we strengthen their mental health we do have civil society institutions and if this question is from uh, mizoram we do know that there are a uh, number of organizations that work on this but um, yes it's an absolutely important concern uh, that uh, the lack of access to care and facilities uh, can lead to uh, more frustration on the part of people who are already vulnerable uh, there is a uh, another student who has a, a former student or probably who has uh, said that uh, they have a very adverse frame of mind given the uncertainty all over and in the absence of physical and online avenues to reach out to psychologists and social work support at this time what could be an alternative to address this problem so one of the uh, things as we are nearing the end of the lockdown 3.0 what i would say is that if there are zones in which some access uh, of movement and uh, mobility is restored uh, training people at the local level and imparting lay mental health uh, awareness uh, uh, skills and knowledge to people at the community level is probably going to become very important because you are absolutely right uh, mr aryaman that we do not have uh, enough uh, people with access to online support so uh, but you know as having said that i must also add that we have had a number of telephone calls in these helplines that we have been uh, doing uh, with uh, people who are not necessarily uh you know all the time digitally connected so we do have that but yes you are right in saying that uh, we need to probably find other measures and other alternatives uh i hope i have asked all of answered all of the questions um and uh, if i haven't i'm sorry if time does what do you suggest for women who are coping with multiple difficulties playing different roles um again you know wherever it is possible uh, i think i would uh, suggest that online connections and online support groups for women uh, the need has been very very uh, huge we know a lot of uh, women who are actually saying that they have begun uh, having these online support groups which are very very useful at, at specified times uh, in the day uh, just so that they feel that they are not completely at a loss and uh, by themselves so these kind of thing and as the restrictions get moved then maybe we can look at uh, other ways of uh, contacting them uh, and uh, helping them okay thank you so much uh, dr kalpana i think the can i just answer one more question okay. uh, and that is about somebody who says i'm a psychiatric social worker and can i uh i mean i wish to give my services voluntarily um yeah i i am uh, if you are a psychiatric social worker there is the apswp the association for uh, uh, psychiatric social work uh, professionals you are welcome to reach out uh, we have uh, people uh, from all across the country if you have passed out from either the nimhans or cip or any one of these institutions please contact the department they'll tell you how to get on it it's also available on the web and uh i will give the uh, con concluding remarks uh, from what we have heard today uh, from both the experts uh, you know uh, obviously we are in a situation of a catch 22 you know but we do have a lot of things that that that, that can be done man is a social being and yet man being social is the reason why 
this whole outbreak also took place. And uh, as the saying goes, you know, no one is safe until everybody is safe. So we have to take extra precaution. And, uh, and we need, you know, the, the most important thing about what we learned today would be, you know, to mobilize community, to mobilize community at the The tertiary level, level, and then to work together, and then uh, come out with 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 an effective response, uh, so that we can actually deal with the emerging problems that are taking place. Obviously, the problems are are very diversified, and in in, in a country like India, where you know not only problems, where 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 even society is diversified, so you know the challenges that keeps emerging is is, is different at different time and space and uh, and and for a place like mizoram today you know uh, obviously we know that uh, uh, you know we have had a couple of cases uh, but within mizoram we have had only one case but outside mizoram there were a couple of cases and and obviously uh, uh, they have succumbed to these cases and we have also experienced a lot of stigma experienced a lot of discrimination not only to those uh, you know, uh, affected people, but uh, uh, with the virus, but also with the families. And so these are some of the concerns that, you know, like uh, we should be looking into, like what Dr. Kalpana said and uh, even, even Dr. Kurtney. Uh, these will take place, but we have to work together. There has to be a, you know, multicultural and obviously an interdisciplinary approach to handling uh, uh, the, the, the present outbreak you know that we are facing today and uh, you know there has to be a kind of a positive concern rather than a negative concern and in in our mindfulness uh, about the spread we must take care that we do not violate the rights of you know uh, other people and we have been seeing that even 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 from the uh, you know civil societies uh, you know in in some hamlets and even from the government itself uh, you know, so, so concerns should be such that, or even mindfulness should be such that we do not at all, you know, uh, um, cross the lines of, of, of freedom as well as cross the lines of uh, rights of people. And, and at present, now we are reaching the, the, the you know, uh, the end of third lockdown in India. And this is where, you know, uh, internationally, at present, the trajectory of you know like uh, of, of, of uh, you know uh, it's 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 increased to 100 percent 130 percent also and even in India we see we also see a, a very uh, you know increasing trend is also there and and obviously these are some of the concerns and and you know like I said the very nature of man being social is 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 what makes us very vulnerable like for example in in, in a place like Mizoram uh, although uh, Dr. Kalpana said that, you know, community networks are very strong, civil society is very strong. Again, networks are strong, neighborhood model, you know, we live the neighborhood model. But obviously these uh, could, you know, could, could, could have, you know, uh, unintended consequences. If we are too close, you know, unlike what Dr. Gurney says, you know, like uh, people are getting back together, you know, people are learning about the importance of community, families, you know, uh, uh, what ties have been, you know, have been more strong with community ties. But here, the problem is that community ties are too strong that, you know, it could lead to risk, risky situation as well as uh, increase our vulnerability. And so, uh, as far as Mizoram is concerned, these are the things that we should think about, uh, make sure that, you know, like uh, the realities that we live in today, uh, defined by traditions and culture, does not at all hamper you know like uh, the situation in terms of uh, COVID-19 and uh, another another local context here of course it has been discussed by the the the, the first two speakers in some length is that you know uh, too many people here have opinions you know that are baseless uh, and and it causes fear you know and then uh, there are too few people with concrete knowledge to actually make things work and there are too few population to seek right information about you know the, the disease itself and this is creating a sense 
a senseless fear among the public here. And, and you know, like obviously anxiety is normal, but anxiety with a sense, you know, uh, needs to be, uh, you know, I mean, in all of us, I call it fear sense, you know, rather than having fear without sense. So we should have fear with sense. And, and, and to do that, we, we have to be knowledgeable about certain aspects of, of, of the disease, certain, certain aspects of the pandemic for which, you know, today we are actually having this program. And so uh, with that, I think, uh, you know, we will end the talk show. If I will just open one, you know, one, two, two three few minutes for, for the other speakers, if they would wish to, you know, give any final comments. Just want to give my thanks for the opportunity to participate. It, this is very edifying, and Dr. Henry and Dr. Kalpana, I really enjoyed your remarks and presentation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's just. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 yeah. I would also like to just um, thank you for the opportunity and. Uh, Let's, uh, I, I, I'm very, very, uh, you know, humbled by the kind of participation that there is. And there are so many people and I feel that we have not been able to do justice in answering all of the questions. But um, thank you all for, for that interest to, to the participants for having, you know, spent the last two and a half hours here. And uh, thanks again to the Vice Chancellor and to Mizoram University. Okay, thank you to the speakers. Uh, hopefully we will meet again. Maybe we will come up with another program. Let's see. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, to all the participants, you will be sent e-certificates for those who want. Please, uh, for those who want certificates, please uh, inform me in my mail and then accordingly we will send e-certificates to all of you. And yes, uh, the, uh, the PowerPoints presented by the speakers will also be sent to you in your mail if you need it. Okay. So, with that, uh, uh, early morning for Dr. Kurtney, you know, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then obviously good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much. Suraj. Yes, uh, can I end the uh, meeting now? Yes, yes, you can end the meeting now. Thank you so much. Huh? Okay. Mr. Suraj, okay, the recording, please uh, keep it and then maybe, you know, like later on we'll, we'll, we'll uh, uh, upload it.